What's up, Tubeland? Today I'm just posting a quick addendum to my last video that will consist of a quick fact check, uh, i.e. something that I got wrong in the last video, uh, and then also touching on a couple of interesting questions I was asked uh, since I, I made my last update and that I wanted to comment on uh, really quick for you guys. So yes, this video uh, is entirely in reference to my previous video, Ada versus the World, Chapter 1. So if you haven't watched that one yet, I would highly recommend doing so, uh, as otherwise this video will make no sense. Okay, the first order of business is actually a fact check on myself, because as I was doing the research for Chapter 2 of this series, I bumped into some information that definitely conflicts with the statement that I made in the last video. Uh, now this is a technicality, and it really doesn't impact the overall message of the last video, but for my own sanity, I'm going to have to correct myself, so thank you all for bearing with me. And uh, this is something I was sure I'd read in a document that talked about differences between the Ouroboros protocol paper and the actual in uh, implementation of Ouroboros. Uh, but now I can't actually find anything from IOHK that says anything about it. So, um, and going back over my own notes, I found that I was actually sort of vague on this. And, and so I think that what happened is that, you know, as I was trying to untangle the Ouroboros papers in my own mind, I must have written down an idea that I had, an, an idea that was just kind of a, a placeholder, uh, and maybe I stuck a pin in that idea and then just kind of forgot about it. Uh, so the wrong thing that I said was that on the Ouroboros protocol, when a chosen slot leader is unavailable, the protocol just sort of rolls over and allows for a new slot leader to be chosen. Okay, now let me be absolutely clear on this. I was 100% wrong about that. Uh, the paper says very specifically that the chosen slot leader has the sole right to produce a block for a given slot. Furthermore, the slot leaders are actually determined before an epic even begins. Uh, and that's based upon, as we discussed, based upon a random number that is generated in the previous epic. And there is nothing in the specification that allows for those selections to change. So that's what I got wrong. Uh, and and I, but I want to add some value here anyway, and so maybe we can uh, all maybe deepen our understanding of Ouroboros just a little bit, learn from my mistake. Uh, I'm going to go back and put this into context for you. And, and here's what this actually means. I told you last time that we have this evil dude, and he wants to make an evil fork of the Cardano blockchain. So, and he wants to do this so he can change the transaction history in some way. So to do that, he has to reference the last epic of the legit chain. And he's going to be forced to use the randomly generated number from that epic to assign the block leaders in the first epic of his evil fork. Now, just to get one of the questions that I was asked out of the way, someone did ask me here, uh, they asked, why is the evil dude forced to use a random value from a previous epic of the legitimate chain? Can he just make up his own random value uh, and do whatever he wants if it's going to be his own chain anyway? To answer that question, remember that Ouroboros gives us a closed loop. Uh, where, for instance, uh, where a random value generated in epic 10, let's say, predicts the block leaders that must be used in Epic 11. And then Epic 11 predicts the block leaders that we have to use for Epic 12 and so forth. So yes, this evil dude is forced to use a code that he gets from some previous Epic. He has to get a random value from somewhere. And where he gets that value from will specifically identify the chain that he's going to be adding onto. Uh, so the easiest thing for him to do, and what we'll see, really the only thing he can do, is to take the legit chain and start adding some blocks onto the end of it. If he doesn't want to use the legit chain to do this, his only alternative really is to make up his own chain uh, that has a slightly different history. 
But if he does that, it's going to result in the first block, the genesis block of his new chain, being different than the genesis block of the legit chain. And it's really easy for all of the nodes to check the genesis block to make sure the chain they're connecting to at least starts off with the history, that one small part of history that everybody has already agreed to. Or to put it another way, that genesis block can never change. And since it can't change, and because of the closed loop of Ouroboros, our evil dude is forced to take that legit chain and interrupt it at some point after the Genesis block. So here we are. He's going to be forced to take the random value from the last epic of the legit chain and accept the slot leader assignments that it gives him. And like I said last time, some of those slot leader assignments, well, they, they just aren't going to work for our, for our evil dude because it's going to assign him some slot leaders that aren't on his evil network. And he might have a few of them. He might like this one here. Uh, but unless he controls at least 51% of the network, he won't have enough. They just aren't, they aren't going to be around on his network to sign these blocks. So he has this problem of there being some holes in the first epic of his evil chain. Now, up to this point, everything that I've shown you is absolutely true. Here's where we went wrong. What I showed you at this point was that the evil dude can somehow just assign some new slot leaders of his own choosing. Uh, I said he could use these holes, these missing slot leaders, as kind of a way to give himself permission to assign new slot leaders. And I said the way he'll get caught is that the other nodes will still be able to see that he made these reassignments. Now they'll be able to see the history of his chain and they'll see that he had these, these holes. Well, that seems to be my own evil imagination at work because that is absolutely 100% BS. Sorry guys. Uh, so here's what will actually happen. On the Cardano network, each elected slot leader has the sole responsibility of producing the block for a given slot. If that block leader can't fulfill its duty, then the block will simply be missing. That's right. If you don't have the slot leader on your network, the whole block assignment is just gone. So here I'm, I'm showing you that uh, with these empty blocks. Uh, but these empty blocks are actually just placeholders uh, because in reality, on the evil blockchain, these are just missing blocks. Now, what our evil money bags can try to do is he can take his, this epic, even though it's got some holes in it, he can still use it to, to generate a random value uh, that he can use to assign the slot leaders for the next epic. And what's true at this point is that now he can assign block leaders that are based upon who is actually available on his network. He can just make his network say, you know, oh, all of those other slot leaders just aren't participating anymore. Here's the pool of participating stakeholders, so let's just choose, you know, from some of these. And so now he can assign his own nodes uh, to produce the evil epic number two, it's exclusively his nodes. Of course, just like before, Anybody who looks at his evil fake chain of super fakeness can see that there's this point in the history of his blockchain where you have a bunch of missing blocks. Uh, in the papers that specify Ouroboros, this is referred to as the chain density. So in the parlance of Cardano, we're able to eliminate the fake chain because it will, at some point in its history, have an epic with a much lower density than the legitimate chain assuming that we have an honest 51% majority. So here we are. We can compare our money bags chain to the Charles Hoskinson chain. And over here, we have these disconnected nodes that need to reconnect to the network. Uh, old Charles can still get in his clever line about there being some holes in this evil plot. And then money bags can still have his nonsensical, that's what she said, come back. And of course, Charles can still be like, uh, what? And uh, then the poor confused nodes can hop right back on the correct network and we all live happily ever after. 
Uh, but notice here that this time I did give Charles one missing block because like I said in the last video, this does happen sometimes. It's just that it's going to happen a lot more on the bogus chain as a result of pulling away from the network while not controlling at least 51% of the network. So this is really, I think, uh, just a beautiful, elegant solution to a very tough problem. And I hope that by us going back and, and digging back down into it a little bit more, um, you guys will be able to appreciate that even just a little bit more than last time. Um, okay, so in addition to my fact check, I did have two questions slash comments uh, that I wanted to address really quick. The first question deals with participation. I talked about in the last video how you need to control 51% of the nodes on the network in order to have a chance of successfully attacking Ouroboros. In order to do that, you need to control about 51% of the staked ADA tokens. What's true, though, is that not all of the ADA tokens will necessarily be staked. Uh, so it's actually very important that the Cardano network is able to promote a high level of participation because the more honest participants we have, the greater the expense would be of attacking the network. Uh, so I have a couple of comments here. Uh, number one, I think that unlike what you see on some of the other proof of stake models, such as Ethereum, you actually have a strong incentive to participate on the Cardano network. Uh, on the Ethereum network, for example, under Casper, uh, in order to participate, you are actually forced to lock up your stake for uh, some period of time and be subject potentially to having your tokens slashed due to bad actors. As I mentioned in the last video, I think that is going to disincentivize some people from participating. Uh, conversely, on Cardano, I can't really see any reason in the world why you wouldn't want to participate because you essentially have guaranteed returns with no obligations whatsoever. Uh, and basically no risk. So your tokens aren't going to be locked up and you don't have to worry about someone else causing your, your tokens to be slashed. You don't even need to operate a node uh, or share your private key with anyone. You can just stake your ADA to a stake pool, sit back and relax, and take in your rewards. Uh, under those conditions, personally, I'm predicting a very high level of participation uh, on Cardano. Now, next time, uh, we're going to also talk about EOS, and there are some things about that network that I think might actually be causing some, some people, might be disincentivizing some people uh, to participate. Uh, those, some, some of those things are in the news right now, uh, but again, we'll, we'll talk about that in the next installment of the series. So, uh, on to number two. I got asked another question that basically basically goes like this. Uh, under the Ouroboros protocol, what keeps a bad actor from running lots and lots of nodes and finding some way to attract lots of honest participants to stake their ADA on those nodes? And then what stops them from then like using those nodes to attack the network? Or in other words, you could just run a bunch of nodes, let's say hundreds of nodes, and you could have thousands of honest people staking their ADA tokens on your nodes. And you might not own hardly any ADA at all. Uh, all you have to do is provide this staking service. You provide it far and wide and you attract honest participants to, to your corrupt nodes, you gain their trust, and then you use all of that honest, honestly staked ADA to attack the network. Uh, and that's what's actually called a Sybil attack. And he here again, Cardano does provide a, a unique solution to that problem. Uh, this actually relates, again, to some points that I want to make about EOS. Uh, and so I'm going to actually leave you guys with a bit of a cliffhanger here uh, and let you kind of maybe come up with your own ideas about that between now and the next installment. And then in the next installment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to dive into that part of the problem. And uh, that'll be a, a big part of Chapter 2. Uh, so another question that I'm starting to hear a little bit of is basically when chapter two. Um, I wish I had something more specific to tell you guys, uh, but at this point, I'm going to have to give one of the dreaded it'll be ready when it's ready style responses. Um, 
I can tell you that I'm that I am well into writing it, but I also have a lot going on personally, mostly just job stuff. Uh, so, it's, but really, it's just a matter of me finding the time that I need to do the next update the way I know it needs to be done, and uh, that would definitely include me finding a slightly longer period of time for fact checking. So, hopefully. Uh, we don't have to come back and <laughs> and fact check me again. Also, before I close out on this one, I want to do just a quick bit of housekeeping. Uh, hey, if you guys haven't added me on Twitter, I would like to see what you guys are tweeting about. Uh, I have a link to my Twitter account from my YouTube account, or you can just look me up on Twitter under the rainbow table. Um, add me on there, follow me, and I will follow you back. Additionally, if you guys are browsing my channel on the Brave browser, I now have enabled the ability to donate uh, through a little donate icon on the Brave browser. Uh, your donations would help me to be able to spend a little bit more time working on these things. Uh, so uh, even, even small donations add up for me, guys. Uh, so if if you can help out that way, that would be great. If you don't have the Brave browser, what I'm actually gonna do is include a download link in the description. If you haven't tried the Brave browser, give it a try. It's a browser that basically blocks all the ads for you. It shows you some, some select ads, uh, but it also pays you cryptocurrency for, for looking at those ads. So it's a pretty cool, pretty sweet deal. Um, if you haven't tried it, Click my, click my download link in the description, install it. If you, if you install it and you use it and you like it, uh, I will actually receive a credit for that and it will be at no cost to you. So those are a couple of ways that you can support the channel and uh, help me to you know, be able to spend a bit more time uh, doing what I really wanna do, which is uh, talking about cryptocurrency for you with you guys. With that, I want to thank you all for tuning in again. I hope I was able to add a little bit of additional value for you uh, with this addendum. And I will see you all in chapter two. See you next time.